of Truerin, a Welsh speaking um, a Welsh speaking valley in North Wales that was controversially flooded to provide water to the city of Liverpool during the 60s had a larger impact on history than I'd realised. It was this event that sparked more political movements in Wales as, and as we began to see the development of the Free Wales Army, a paramilitary Welsh nationalist organisation whose objective was to establish an independent Wales and Cymdeithas of Iaith, an action pressure group in Wales that campaigns for the right of Welsh people to use the language in every aspect of their lives. I decided that I wanted to begin looking at the story of Truerin, but was wary of my position and voice and how that could counteract with the story. I began to explore the effects of industrialization and building reservoirs in Wales and how many communities had to be abandoned to support growing communities elsewhere. A lot of Welsh culture and language stems from rural places. Losing these rural communities had a detriment effect on Wales, and many of these valleys that lost their communities are now filled with water, and the land surrounding is further utilised for growing non-native trees as crop or farming animals. In some cases, history has been preserved and recognised and celebrated through resources, one that may explore an area's biodiversity and encourage individuals to spend healthy leisure time in nature. Elan Valley is a good example of this. I began to visit reservoirs local to me and for the first time began to feel the irreversibility of what was lost. I began to think about the water how water is a resource, how we need this strange translucent liquid to survive and how lucky we are to have great water in Wales. I began to question Wales' position and ownership of these lands, how some reservoir sites had been sold off for pennies, how some water didn't belong to us, how the hills, how big the hills should have been along the water's surface, what traces of the land was lurking underneath, how the land around the reservoirs was so desolate and silent. I began to read stories about what existed in these locations before, how there would have been a village, shop, a school, a church, houses and farms. I remembered memories about hearing the story of Fangan Dane as a child in school, another village that was threatened to be flooded local to me after the flooding of Chuirin, and how the community won and the village was saved. I remembered coming home from school that day as a child and wondering if our house would one day be flooded and if we'd have to abandon our village, but being reassured that that would never happen. It's also surreal to think about water and loss of land in the realm of climate change as communities along the coast are at danger of being lost due to rising sea levels. These thoughts resulted in a body of work called the Gathering Grounds. The gathering ground is what they call the whole area that gathers and collects water. It looks at how the waters run off the hills and all its sources. The reservoir is then situated, grown and built in the basin valley of the grounds. I began to look at free reservoirs in Wales that supply water to across the border. Lake Fernoy, the first reservoir built in Wales near Welshpool that supplies water to Liverpool. Elan Valley, a chain of reservoirs that were built in near Ryder, mid Wales, to supply water to Birmingham. And Llyncaelin, situated near Bala, the second reservoir that was built to supply water to Liverpool. I began to travel and visit these sites for the first time. Having researched their stories prior to my visit, I took along different cameras and collected and gathered images from the locations and sort of sat still and observed the lakes. As well as photographing in traditional ways, I also began to photograph with Polaroids and collected certain rocks from the locations that I felt represented the shapes of the landscape that I'd noticed when visiting. The work became a mixture of processes where I was using water to move the Polaroid image onto the rock, creating irreversible changes to an image that I felt represented the irreversibility of flooding and building a reservoir. I also began to collect archival images of the sites to understand the land as before and collected old maps and documents. 
I then graduated in the summer of 2020, which as we know was a unique time to graduate. And instead of exhibiting the work in a degree show, I made and self-published 30 books of the work. The work was also included in Many Voices One Nation Two at the Photo Gallery in Cardiff, an exhibition that included work from 12 emerging Welsh photographers in Wales, looking at Wales today. Pre-COVID, I imagined leaving Wales and moving to the city to widen horizons but without much option, I moved back to Carmarthenshire, near the village of Crosshands, a place my family and I like to call the centre of the universe, as all roads lead to the big dangerous roundabout of Crosshands. During the time we had to stay home, I frequently explored a chain of local limestone quarries, as I still felt drawn to the way humans can use dynamite or tools to take and alter a landscape and how these quarries remained like hidden gems in the local nature reserves. Once loud, polluted, dusty places had now become places for rest and exploring. I also couldn't help but think how these landscapes would be filled with working men and how women would have been at home looking after the house and family and how fortunate I am to be able to climb fences, to see the way the land has been worked and look, look at its history. These works remain quite playful and haven't quite been resolved yet into any form, but it was a great chance to begin to experiment and um, also begin to integrate environmental photographic processes into my work and suss out a new way of working as a recent graduate. After a year and a half of being home, I spontaneously relocated to Corris, an ex-slate mining village just in the border of Snowdonia National Park, nestled in the steep valley just north of Machanche. In November, I was invited to spend a week in Corris at Studio Maylor, an artist in residency programme founded by Dr. Veronica Clarko, an Australian artist, researcher and printmaker. She had begun working on a research project titled We Live of the Land, The Land as Other, a multidisciplinary art exploration responding to the history, story of the land, language and land, a sense of place, the environmental and rewilding movements, and the positioning of land by outsiders as other, looking at Wales as a playground and tourism commodity. It uses environmental theorists and wisdom spoons and Val Plumwood debates of listening and acknowledging the land's agency to provide a new way to interrogate land's current and historical usage and interrogate artists in Wales to respond with collaborative action between language and land and the diverse people who claim and use the land from original inhabitants to incomers to casual tourists. Using visual art as research responds to the world leading linguist and authority on endangered languages Professor David Crystal's statement that if we want them to see what the situation is, then artists can help us more than anyone else. Crystal argued that though lecturing in academic and books play an important role in informing audiences, they only reach a tiny amount. Therefore, it's down to us to disseminate it and hand it in other ways. After spending five days here as a participant in the project, I asked Veronica if she needed any assistance and within two weeks I relocated and began working as a research assistant and supporting retreats as more artists came and visited and responded to the landscape. When thinking about the theme of landscape in relation to this talk, I couldn't help but think about Wales in a wider sense. There are so many nooks and dips in our valleys, along our estuaries and near our borders all containing unique stories, identities, different dialects and activities. It's impossible to grasp every area fully by oneself. It has been surreal to re-emerge into the landscape of Wales after a period of remaining hyperlocal. Moving to a new rural community, I've noticed how important individuals are to understand a sense of place. I, a newcomer passing through, can only grasp so much about an area's story. It is by individuals documenting, whether that be through drawing, photographing, recording, 
writing and responding or sharing discussions that we can see and think and begin to bring new ideas about the land, not just for us, but also for future generations. And I feel our voices, whether that be as village dwellers or city dwellers, travelers or visitors, are all important in contributing to a narrative that can represent Wales today. I am now going to introduce you to our first speaker, Yastin Time. Yastin Time was brought up in Bodzian, Penllyn, and is the author of three collections of poetry and a novel for young adults in Welsh. He co-founded and co-edits Cyhoeddiadarstan, an independent publisher platforming new voices in Welsh language writing. He is also a musician, performing with a number of bands, including folk supergroup Pendirvig. He now lives and works in Caernarfon and has recently become a parent. Much of Yastin's work explores the state of the community, Caernarfon and world around him, and how different elements within those spaces interact as we move through them. He recently co-edited Welsh Plural, a volume of essays on the future of Wales, and is working on a concept album of poetry and music. There we go. Hello, Yastin. <laughs> Hello, it's me. Um, do me the... Do me the amat sabir? Yeah, so um, Yastin will be speaking in Welsh um, for his presentation. So if you missed the beginning of the talk and can't understand Welsh, we have the interpretation button at the bottom and we'll post some instructions into the chat too, as we currently have a translator in the chat. So, yeah. As we should do, Diochi Yastin, Kinini Dacha. Yeah, happy. Um, I'm brave, but I'm not. Um, or feddwl am am a senior to Tirwe, doing Amalia on the middle. I'm Gavril Enwog, can do another no Nan Shepherd, the Living Mountain at the end of Gavril and all. Gavril back back there. Um, uh, with the Gosadan and the Alban. Oh, he's so on. I'm Gerdet Munnis. Well. Cerdded i fewn i'r mynydd, yn hytrach na cerdded i fyn i'r mynydd. Um, fel pobl, dwi'n meddwl mae gen ni obsesiwn weithiau efo cyrraedd y copa bob amser. Um, cofnodi ryw, ryw record, gwthian hynna'n mor bell a'n ni'n gallu mewn ryw, ryw faes neu gilydd. Um, a dwi'n dall hynna'n iawn, dwi'n, dwi'n greadr fy hun sy'n gallu bod yn, yn obsesiynol iawn am bethau. Uh, pam dwi'n cael ar fewn i rhywbeth newydd, Nei, yn cael rhyw nod yn ymhen, dwi eisiau cyrraedd yna cyn bod wedi cychwyn bron iawn. Felly, i fi, pan dwi'n meddwl am tirwedd, dwi'n meddwl am yr, am yr gamp na o arafu lawr cerdded i mewn i'r tir yn hytrach na dros y tir. Um, dyna ydy'r her bob amser, dwi'n meddwl. Yn si dreilio y blwyddyn a hanner cyntaf o oes i ar yn esenllu, lleodd fy, fy rhieni yn, yn ffarmio. Um, oedd nhw wedi cyfarfod yn uh, y coleg yn Aberystwyth. Um, y ddau oedd nhw'n yn ddi Gymraeg, um, gafod nhw'n swydd yn, yn edrych ar ôl y ffermy yn esenllu. Um, a yn fan o oedd nhw am um, blwyddyn a hanner cyntaf o OIC yn byw yn hunan gynhaliol o'r tir a'r mor. Um, a hwnna'n bywyd caled iawn, um, mae'n hawdd iawn rhamantu'r syniad o o fyw ar, ar ynys fach. Um, ond wrth gwrs, maen nhw wahaniaeth mawr rhwl ymweld, ymddiwrnod neu ymwythnos um, i, i fyw yno rownd y flwyddyn um, ar gaeafa yn galwad yna. Um, a wedyn nath nhw symud, pa maen nhw'n rhyw ddyn a mis oed i ffarm fel y tyn sôn yn, yn bodiaen ym Henllyn, uh, ger nefyn. Ac yn fan o'n eisiau dreulio fy mae gwraith i gyd um, wedyn. Ac y bywyd yn, yn galad yn fan ar y degad oedd na ddim uh, lot, o, lot o arian wrth, wrth geisio byw o'r tir um, oedd nhw wastad mewn rhyw, rhyw frwyd, oedd nhw wastad mewn rhyw frwyd i'r efo'r efo dirwedd, dwi'n meddwl, um, felly mae'r beth yna sy'n yn, 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 yn gymleth o'r, o'r cychwyn mewn ffordd. Um, dim llawer o arian oedd, oedd un peth oedd y dirwedd yn ei roed, oedd, oedd lle a gofod, um, ac eto wrth dyfu fyn nhw Weithiau o'n i wrth y modd hefo'r holl ofod yna, yna, ac weithiau oedd o'n 
ofod mawr oedd yn hefyd yn carchar y rhywun yn gwneud rhywun deimlo bod o'n gysalio, bod o'n rhwystredig. Um, felly rhyw gyfnodau fela byddai rhywun yn mynd rhywun ddyn nhw. Um, os a pwynt i'n unigryw, o'n un tyfu fyny hefyd, um, rhywun i di Gymraeg, mae'n ardal um, hollol, wel, un ardal oedd mwya Gymraeg yn Nhymru, lle. Um, wedi nhw'n hynna'n ddifir oherwydd fod yn ei mewn cymuned amaethyddol, Gymraeg, Gymraeg iawn, ond eto y uh, sort of yr er er cymlestod bach yna yna hefyd yn cyfrannu at betha. Ond ond wrth a, wrth adael y lle yna wrth, wrth fynd at i fywyd i hi yn dy meddwl. Oedd rhywun wir yn, yn sort of dechrau meddwl am am y tir am y peth yma. Mae o fedrwch chi fod yn rhy agos at y tir ella i sylweddoli bod i nerth a, a gwerth y peth yn meddwl. Dy meddwl aml am y pethau sydd wedi siapio yn sirwedd â ni um, yn enwedig yn sirwedd â gwledig ni ar lefel sylfunol, sort of geolegol, y rhyw lifoedd, cramen y ddiar yn, yn symud, y platiau'n mynd dros i gilydd, y dan i gilydd, um, heibio i gilydd. Um, a rhywun y ffaith bod yn sirwedd â ni dan, dan warchau, dan, dan omosodiad um, y bwgan mawr ar hyn o bryd ydy, ydy newid hinsawdd um, sy'n dechrau digwydd mor gyflym bod ni'n gallu gweld o'n digwydd o, o flaen yn llygad, o flwyddyn i flwyddyn yn hytrach na, rhywbeth sy'n digwydd o ganrif i ganrif. Ar pethau llai all-encompassing na, sydd yn creu newid yr un peth, yr bygythiad i gymunedau ieithyddol, diwydiana, ffordd o fyw, crefta, cynhenid. A fel dwi'n gweld am ar pethau mae gyd yn chlethu fewn i rhywbeth o heat map, sy'n, sy'n dangos i ni lle gan i arni yn yn perthynas ni efo'r tir ar mor. Newid enw tyddyn neu gats ar rhywun yn, yn un lle gysgotwr yn, yn colli waith yn bai nyddyn. Um, gwenoliaid sy'n arfer dod i nythu yn bondor tu heb ddychwelyd flwyddyn yma. Tu newydd yn cael ei adeiladu sydd yn llawer iawn rhy fawr a drud a moethus i neb llel fy dyfod gobaith o'i brynu bo. Ddim yn bethau sydd yn newid llawer iawn os y gwbl os ti'n sbio ar y map OS, ond mae nhw'n bethau sy'n bodoli, bethau sy'n heiddi cael ei cofnodi a'i nodi a sylwi arnyn nhw. A llynedd, ym un o'r pethau, un o'r projectau fi sy'n ddigon lwc i sy'n gael comisiwn i gyw wneud llynedd oedd comisiwn gan cwmni tebot a Invertigo Theatr. Um, oedd yn nhw'n galw am projectau o dan y thema cerr undod. A'r syniad oedd bysa nifer artistiaid gwahanol sy'n gweithio yn ardal pen llun yn creu gwaith ar y thema yna o bererindod. undod. Um, a fel dwi'n tyfu wrth y modd yn, yn cerdded a, a bod allan. Um, a nes i bendrynu mae mae mata byr thema hynny fysa cerdded o olly dwi'n byw rhywun yn yng Nghaerfon. Um, a'r hyd ar fod i'r gogledd Arfon y llun um, a gynnwys enllu sef lle uh, o'n i'n yn fapu bach um, fel diwedd y daith o ffordd. Um, yn sort of yn bras ddilyn yr er, er llwybr yr hen llwybr perinion sy'n dibod yno ers, ers cyfrifoedd. Um, felly rhyw berinion yn fan o, o ddychwelyd adra i fi heibio i, i sawl lle sy'n dibod yn adra. Um, a, a bob dim o'n i angen am rwsos a ar ynghen yn llyg yn gynnwys y, y ffidil sef y brif offerin cerdlorol dwi'n chwarae. Um, a ben i si greu oedd sweet o, o gerddoriaeth um, neu soundscape os lic i chi o'r or holl amatebion nes i gasglu ar hyd y, y ffordd um, y meddwl am yr holl bethau na dwi'n newydd fod yn sôn amdanyn nhw. Um, ond dwi'n mynd i ia rannu a bell un o'r darnau unigol na thod allan o'r bererindod yna efo chi rhywun. Um, a mae'r ein cyntaf sgen nai, um, mae'r ddau dwi'n mynd i rannu dydd gwir yn dod o'r, o'r diwrnod nes i drilio ar yn esenllu ar, ar ddiwedd y, y siwr yna. Um, ac, uh, just y mata byr yw hanes lleol oedden ni yn yr achos yma. Um, ac yn ôl yr hanes mi oedd John Williams yr ail sef berenu'n enllu yn ystod cyfnod y Rhyfel Byd Cyntaf. Um, oedd o wedi mynd yn bethdalwr ac yn alcoholig. Um, mae debyg efo hynny'n ganlyniad i'r ffaith fod o fel, fel brenin yr ynys um, efo hawl i i gymryd perchnogaeth o'r casgenu o whisky oedd yn cael ei golchi i'r lan ar yr ynys o'r llonga oedd wedi, wedi suddo um, allan ar y môr. Um, a wedyn yr, yr chwebl ydy, dwi'n gwybod faint o wirionedd sydd iddi, 
um, fod pobl yr ynys ar ôl methu rhesymu na gweld ffordd o wella yr, yr hen frenin wedi codi pentwr mawr o, o gasgenu ar y traeth yn Aberdaron. Um, a bod nhw'n mynd â John Williams i ben mynydd enllu a di, di dangos o pentwr casgenu iddo fo. Um, a dyna wedi denu fo i, I adael yr ynys. Ac um, yr hanes trist iawn ydi bod o wedi dod i'r lan yn Aberdaron ac roedd yna bobl yno yn aros amdano fo i wglido fo i'r, I'r workhouse yn mwllheli um, ac yna bia fo um, am weddill i oes. Um, a mae hon yn, yn hen alaw o'r enw glan meddod mwyn um, wedi fyfformio ar gopa mynydd enllu um, wrth edrych draw am drwyn penryn llun a cabardaron. Uh, ar cydrana mae ei sbos ydy yr hen alaw drodiadol yn un peth. Mae'r hanes niwlod yma ac yna yr lleoliad dyrddol a, a holl gyfoeth hynny. Um, a dwi'n lico meddwl am y math yma beth, fel rhyw fath o gartyn post os lico chi sydd yn rhyw fath o fynd at rhyw, mynd ar rwy'n at ddatansoddiad o un lle a'r un adag yn ôl dehongliad un person. Felly dwi'n mynd i drio'n orau i rannu sgrin ar hwnnw. A wedyn, mae'r darn arall oedd gynnau i yn un fwy byrfyfyr um, ar hyd y syniad mae allas y gynnau 
o fapio drwy'r gyfryngau sydd ddim fel arfer yn cael eu cysylltu efo mapio. A dawn symorloi ydy nhw hwn. Um, Darn byr iawn wedi gyfansoddi ar glogwyn ger y goleidu ar ein lli, um, ar hwnna yn sydd yn rhywio fewn i holl yn y graig wrth yn ymlu. Chwarae gwmpas efo nodau patrymau ddim yn trio rheoli gormod ar y broses dyna fyddai yn neud a dwi'n licio ar ystod yr elfen an o'r ffenedig na bach chi'n gael wedi sy'n, sy'n debyg i, i, i y ffordd mae'r, mae'r dirwedd i hun yn, yn an o'r ffenedig. Um, okay. O, mae'n drwg gen i di, dydy hwnna ddim, ddim yn mynd i weithio yn anffodus, dwi ddim yn siŵr iawn pam. Ond um, dyna ni, elle gwch chi fynd ni chwilio amdano fo uh, yn, yn nes ymlaen, pan fyddai di rhaid y, y links yn y chat. Um, dwi ffan mwr iawn o, o waith ac, ac arddull, uh, pobl fel Ceri Rhys Matthews sy'n, sy'n gweithio yn ardal Elisha ar byd i gwybod. Um, Mae thor i'r rhai albwm llynedd yr enw Gwythiana ac mae o'n codi yr sort of yr hen a lawn mae yn defnyddio nhw, yn twistio nhw, yn troelli nhw, yn rhoi nhw at i gilydd i greu rhyw fath o fap o'r ardal mae o uh, yn ei weld eu gwmpas o. A ti'n gallu suddo fewn i hwnna, mae ffordd uh, gweld lle fydd yn agor o dy flaen di. Um, ac efo tre fel ar y tawedd, gwrs, mae gen ti bob math o gymlethdodau um, dwi'n meddwl am y diwydiad copr ar y cystalliadau yma yna efo, efo caethlasiau ddeg ati. Mae'n gallu tynnu pethau o'r cyfnodau yna a'i ail ddychmygu fo, a mae hynna'n beth gwerthor iawn. Um, a lli o'r rhyfedd hefyd, dwi'n, dwi'n edmygu'r mawr o'i, o'i gwaith hi, mae o'r sgwrs yn gweithio lot efo, efo ceri ddig wybod. bod. Um, mae gwaith hi ar y dylen deires mor, mor radical ac a ddoth allan yn unlla pan ddoth allan gynta lle yn y traddodiad Cymraeg, ac eto'r syniad mae o fapio drwy'r sain. Um, mae albwm dwytha hi Sir Vaughan bach yn, yn seiliedig ar, ar y fault line mae sy'n rhedeg ar draws, ar draws Sir Vaughan. Pethau fela yn, yn, yn diddori fi, fi yn eithriadol. Felly, mae'n ysbrydoliaeth i o ran artistiaid yn dod o bobl uh, sy'n aml iawn yn, yn plygu ac yn dehongli rhywbeth hen a traddodiadol at i dibenio ni hynna'n a ger bwyd dweud rhywbeth difyr a, a chyffroes am y byd y cwmpas nhw yn aml iawn. Mae bob, bob tirwedd yn, yn wahanol, um, o ddabu'n sôn fan yna am, am Welsh Plural, ac ydym yn meddwl sy'n un sôn ychydig bach am, am y gyfrol honno. Um, mae gen bawb o fewn bob tirwedd i fersiwn i hunain o honni hi, um, a nes i archwilio ffermio mynydd yng Ngogledd o'r Llewyn Cymru ar gyfer yr ysgrif, nes i gyfrannu i'r gyfrol, nes i hefyd i ichi dolygu hefo Darren Jetty, Greg Mews a Hannah Nisa. Um, ail ddychmygu oedd un o'r geiriau mawr oedd yn un rhaid yn y brif ar gyfer y pobl oedd yn cyfrannu i'r gyfrol yna. Meddwl am dyfodol posib i Gymru um, a mae ail ddychmygu'n tirwedd ni ar, ar hyn dan eisiau fo fod mor bwysig wrth fynd i'r afal ar heriau sy'n, sy'n wynebu ni. Um, felly, dwi'n mynd i darllen rhyw ddetholiad bach o ysgrif uh, sgenau yn y casgliad yna eich hirwan. Um, yn Saesneg, felly, mi geithwyr y cyfieithu ddoriad. Um, a dyma, dyma agoriad yr, yr ysgrif. Uh, y teitl ydy A Clinging Existence, Farming the Uplands of North West Wales. I once sat in the carcass of a merchant vessel on the stony beach of one of Europe's westernmost islands in Ishir. The same forces rushing white top towards me as those that flung her and her cargo, whiskey, stained glass and thread onto the rocks half a century before. The Atlantic Ocean, every wave of it stretched out before me, a great and thrilling unknown of short temper and long creatures. And yet on the hillside behind me, a stooping islander was herding a group of cattle from one field to another. Walking one by one, they appeared as puppets against the backdrop of the empty white sky. I watched them, the farmer and his stock, following in an ancient procession between two pastures on a stubborn rib of rock. 
They seemed so steadfast and at peace as they disappeared over my horizon that they left me there in the rusting hull, wondering whether I had seen them at all. Theirs is a clinging existence, the kind of constant compromise with the elements that makes farming in marginal areas a high input, low output way of life. Such is the case in the UK too, from the Pennines to the Southwest Moors to the mountains of Snowdonia on my own doorstep. Farming families often live below the poverty line, scraping sustenance from barren, exposed land. These are far flung corners. It's to these places that people have fled over the centuries. At times of invasion, they're often thought of as strongholds of the native languages and places where long lost ways of life can be found surviving and thriving. Stodonia itself is commonly portrayed as a place of hiding. From ancient tales of hidden treasure under lake surfaces to modern day tourism campaigns advertising seclusion and escape. Synonymous with this idyllic terminology, however, are forgotten and remote with their far darker connotations. They're used again to draw tourists into the rugged charm of bleak windswept landscapes but the truth is that they're often places forgotten and remote in more senses than one. One in six children in North Wales live in poverty. Although the situation is at its starkest in built up areas such as Wrexham, Carnarvon, rural poverty is a, rare, a very real problem. In addition to low incomes and lack of affordable housing, there's often reduced access to services such as public transport and broadband, the need to travel further for food and supplies, the higher cost of energy and fuel. And yet this is possibly offset in the minds of tourists, wealthy incomers by idyllic rural settings and their heavily promoted benefits for well-being. Holiday cottages marked as bolt holes to escape, marketed as bolt holes to escape from the hustle and bustle of urban life and an unforgiving landscape rebranded as an adventure playground. and but ysgrif, dwi'n sôn am yr, yr hen arfer Cymreig o gael system hafod a hendre wrth ddegeilio defaid, y symudiad o ddefaid o tir haf a thir geia, a tyluoedd sawl ffarm yn dod ynghyd pan fydd angen casglu y diadell o'r, o'r mynydd, cyd symud a cyd dynnu a chyd weithio. Mae yn batrwm y berthynas glos efo'r dirwedd, Ffyrdd o weithio sy'n cael ei gorfodi, ond sy'n just yn gwneud synwyr ar lefel gymunedol a chymdeithaso hefyd. So neu just darllen detholiad bach arall o, o nes at ddiwedd yr, yr ysgrif. Many hill farming communities in Wales have retained elements of ancient transhumance systems. This practice is the movement of livestock across the land according to the seasons, meaning that sheep and cattle spend the milder summer months on the hills in the Havod, and are herded down into the lower, less exposed valleys in autumn to spend the winter months at Erhendrez, closer to the main farmstead. <coughs> Excuse me. The grazing rights for certain hills are often shared by several farms, with each flock grazing within its own canevin or heft, honed over time as part of the sheep's subconscious, making boundary walls and fences unnecessary. The result of this is that gathering the flocks for shearing, for sorting, the annual move down to lower pastures is of necessity a community effort. Three or four generations of several farming families gathering together out on the mountain at the break of day, dogs at heel, to start the day's work. The mountain gather is not a process that can be improved on. It's forced to an extent by the fact that so much of the land can only be accessed by foot. It's a system where every individual is just as important as the next. One break in the human chain can let the whole flock through, but one where the individual must remain an independent unit at the same time. At Havod or Hendrev can be seen as an allegory of the values the farming sector should be upholding above all others, an agriculture where collaboration and community are at the heart of all that's said, all that's done, where food, where food, where food producers never go without food where everyone for themselves is never considered a motto. A sector that encourages new entrants, both from farming families and other diverse backgrounds. A sector that younger people want to re-enter because it offers exciting and viable opportunities. To come back to Neidod Nol, sorry, I went into English. 
I ddod nôl at syniad Nan Shepherd o gerdda i fewn i'r dirwedd yn hytrach na dros y tir. Mae'r math yna agwedd i fy meddwl i, mae bwysig pan ddan ni'n meddwl am ddyfodol tir weddau Cymru, a Chymru hun yn gyffredinol hefyd. Yn y trach na ganelu am y copaw nefo rhyw agwedd lle, dydy o'n bwys be arall sy'n digwydd neu'n cael ei ddinistrio, neu'n cael ei falun y broses, a cam a mawr bras na sy'n anwybyddu'r cyfoeth ar amrywiaeth dan yn traed ni. Dwi mawr na hynna di bedwi'n trio mynd ato fo yn lot yng ngwaith. Um, ac yn ymarddoniaeth hefyd, rhywbeth dwi ddim efo lot o amser i sôn amdan efo heno. Cofnodi'r heina sydd yn y gyfoda dan ni'n symud rwyddyn nhw, yn hytrach na bod efo llygau ar ben y daith bob amser. Dwi wedi orffan drwy rhannu cywaith neu si efo'r artist dawns o Sian Meilir flwyddyn dwytho. Mae yna isdeitlar hwn, felly mi geith cyfieithu ddorffwys eto. Um, dwi'n aml yn teimlo yn hollol ddi am adferth a di egni pan mae'n dod at y brwydra sy'n angen i ni hymladd, os da ni'n mynd i achub yn tirweddau ni, yn planned ni, yn dyfodol ni fel pobl. A dwi'n aml yn, yn archwilio ddi am adferth yna ar, ar galar, really, y, y galar da ni'n gallu teimlo mewn cyswllt efo, efo newid hinsawdd. Um, ac yn y fideo yma, hyd yn oed y syniad fod y galar ar ddi am adferth yna yn gallu apelio weithio, yn gallu bod yn haws bron na wynebu pethau fel maen nhw. Um, felly, dwi'n mynd i adolch chi efo uh, yn y diwedd um, cywaith efo Osian Meilir, gan obeithio uh, i fod o mynd i fod yn bosib i mi rannu. Yn y diwedd, ar un gangen i'r yn y fforest bedredig yn gollwng yr olaf o'i dail, beth feddwn yn wyneb y gwirionedd hwnnw. Gall galar a chywilydd fod yn enwau gwahanol ar yr un wylo. Hwyrach y marnadur munudau olaf y bydd modd o'r diwedd i gramanu'r corff am onglau'r gwir. Taflu dwy fraich am wddf ein terf yn olbeb. Hynny, a gofyn yn y nos anial fi wyneb. Beth yw'r awydd hwn sy'n fy'n hynny weithiau i siglo ar ddibyn? Rhwygodd ymrest ar agor a chlywed y rhyferdwyn chwibanu yn ogof fach y galon. Gofyn, beth os mae dysgu sut i farw yw'r unig ffordd o barhau i fyw. A dyna ni, diolch yn fawr. Diolch, Eston. Um... Yeah, that, that's an incredibly emotional question at the end of that video about, you know, how, how can we continue with our future being so aware of all the changes and impact that it's having. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing your story and you're beginning to share your work as well. It was wonderful. So I think we have time now for um, a five minute comfort break. Um, so you're welcome to go make a cup of tea, stretch your legs, wave your arms. And I would like to invite the audience as well um, to respond in the chat about what the word landscape means to you. Um, so yeah, you can respond at the end during the comfort break or just think about it to yourself about your, your relationship to land. Yeah, we'll start the five minute comfort break now. See you all. Thank you.
Hello, pal. Christ and all, welcome back. Um, I hope that was enough of a comfort break and you, you got to move around. Um, so we're going to try something that I haven't hosted in a Zoom before. Um, so I'm going to begin to share my screen again. Um, Before we welcome our second speaker, Alicia Hughes, we will now collaborate in a tiny interactive activity. Here on my screen, I present you the outline of Wales and invite you all to draw an element or place that links to your immediate surroundings where you are currently. For example, I am currently in Corris and we have lots of forestry, um, steep valleys, a lovely blue river, we also have lots of caves and hidden quarries beneath the trees. So I may begin to draw a cave under the trees. To join in on the drawing, you can click your mouse onto Abby's screen at the top bar or bottom, depending on its positioning, and a drop down menu should appear. And you can select draw as an option. I hope you can all join in. I'm not sure how it works from phone, or iPad, but it's, um, yeah, it's an annotating option. And I would just like you to make your mark on Wales. <laughs> I think that must be Bracelet Bay, Lighthouse, possibly, <laughs> down by Mumbles. Like that, we've got Cardiff. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Anisanki is missing. <laughs> it's in the sea. <laughs> See you, Heston. I feel like we've got a lot of Swansea, <laughs> a lot of Swansea shouting here. <laughs> and we've got a crown. Is that Carnarvon? It should be a castle, but it ended up pink, sorry. <laughs> Did you manage to find the tool pit? Maybe not. I was just checking the chat. <laughs> there we go. So I think I will give that a save. <laughs> And um, yeah, keep that as a document of our locations and spots as we um, 
participate in this talk tonight. Um, so yeah, thank you. It's great to see where everyone is and I hope that was just a fun activity to sink back in and, and connect. <laughs> I would now like to introduce you all to Alicia Hughes, our second speaker tonight. Alicia is a fine artist, photographer and educator living and working in Swansea, South Wales. In 2020, she also graduated from Swansea College of Art in the BA Ons Fine Art degree and has recently finished a 15 month fellowship with Artist Benevolent Fund. Since 2011, Alicia has volunteered for a not-for-profit organization called Blindamice Drop-In Center, supporting those in a local community. Interested in local landscapes and space, Alicia's work is impacted by the times we find ourselves in, what's happening around us politically, socially, and geographically. Through documenting her surroundings, Alicia feels there is an opportunity to start conversations and open new perspectives to the viewer. The landscape is a place that holds a story, not just for Alicia, but for many. How are you, Alicia? I'm good, thanks, and you? Good. Amazing, I can't wait to hear your talk. And um, to begin with, Alicia, I'm going to pick on you now. <laughs> I'd like to ask you what the word landscape means to you. Yeah, so I'll just screen share my PowerPoint and then I'll answer your question, Abby. Um, Can you see a blank screen? Yeah. Um, bear with me two seconds. I don't feel like it would be a Zoom talk unless you had a technical glitch. Um, I'm just going to go and see if I can um, go in and out of the PowerPoint. While Alicia is sorting the PowerPoint, can I just remind everybody about the evaluation questions? Thank you to those of you who've answered. You can send your answers as a direct message to me if you want to, or you can you can put them in the chat to everybody. Um, it's also fine. And remember, there is a link to Welsh Government feedback form. Um, I'll put that link in again as well. How are you getting on, Alicia? I think I've, I think I saw it. Hopefully, Hang on. Okay, great. Um, okay. Can you see? Do I need to minimise um, this in the it's side all, as well? It's all there now, to you. Would you like me to re-ask the question? Yes, go for it. <laughs> so, when you're ready, Alicia, I'd like to ask you what the word landscape means to you. Yeah. So, um, I'd say that landscape for me holds a personal narrative. Um, it's a place of community connection and belonging. It's a place that holds memories. For a lot of people who don't, um, for a lot of people who live where I do, it's a large part of where we spend our time, where we meet other people and how we try to come together as a community. There's a quote by David Hockney that says, I'm constantly preoccupied with how to remove distance so that we can all come closer together. For me, this comes from communicating through the land. While well, sh sharing my story of growing up where I have, I hope to show how important it is for people to feel that they can strive in whatever community or place they live in, regardless of their background, to try and remove barriers, 
that are placed in front of us. It's, some, um, it's something I feel really passionate about and I often wonder how I can take my own experience and how I can contribute to creating a better future around me. Um, for this talk, I'll be sharing my outlook as a young person representing others in my community and how I feel the need to actively respond through empathy and hope. On the screen, you can see a satellite map of blind and mice and surrounding areas. Here is my community. It is a local authority owned council and public housing estate and sits within the Pandari ward. The area falls under the Welsh index of multiple deprivation. And so people living here can um, feel that they're at a disadvantage. And this could be in one or multiple parts of their life, whether that's facing judgment from peers because they've come from a council estate um, or perhaps not getting the support they need in education or healthcare financial difficulty, the list um, continues. It's not always obvious when someone is facing these barriers. In Blind and Mice, we have lots of green spaces, fields, parks, local nature reserves, and a community farm and local woods. They're often used by the community and are all within walking distance. When I invite people um, outside of the area who've never heard of it into Blind and Mice, they often say how lucky we are to have lots of green spaces and how nice the area is. Unfortunately, people who have heard of Blind and Mice usually have a false narrative and often label the people slash area negatively. I feel that this is where conversations need to happen about the impact of using stereotypes and how this can make people feel. Community is a massive part of the landscape here. People are connected to the land and the land with people. Growing up, the local spaces, parks, football fields and woods are a place of familiar faces and a place of conversation. I often find people talking about, where, um, about what their hopes would be for the future and that there would be more opportunities in the area. Um, so respond, in response to the, um, responding to the here and now um, in hope to create better futures, new beginnings and to break down these barriers. So as a community, I feel that we always come together to find a way, a response and action. One example of this is the Blind and Mice Dropping Centre, which is pictured here. Um, it's a not-for-profit organisation run by volunteers who are from the area. And um, we say that it's run from, um, by the community for the community. The drop-in centre um, opened in 2004, but in 2011, it was due to close down because funding had stopped. So there was no funding going into the building. Um, all the paid workers were sort of just, um, just had to leave and it was going to close down. Um, many services in the area have been taken away that I found that things that I've done when I was younger, after school clubs, um, they've all sort of, they're non-existent anymore. Um, and I find that this leaves an impact in the community as well. So my mum, who's pictured on the right here, Karen, um, had been volunteering at the drop-in centre for a couple of months. And uh, as it was due to close down, she decided to take it over. And 10 years on, um, she's still volunteering and sort of running the place as well. Um, the centre aims to bridge gaps of the mist in the community to support people with no questions asked. Some of these resources include a pre-loved com community clothing shop, a community garden, food chair and a food bank, washing machine, free counselling, access to computers, a litter pick and hub and community activities. At the centre, we try to be as resourceful and sustainable as possible. Everything that comes into the centre is reused, um, given to individuals or families or recycled. We encourage people to donate clothes to the community um, shop and these get sold as little as 50 pence and this helps with the running costs. Everything we don't manage to sell will go into recycling which generates more money um, for us to be able to continue providing support to people because we, um, we do a lot of fundraising activities and that sort of relies on keeping the place open. Um, we were one of the first organisations to take part in a food chair scheme so around five years ago, we started collecting surplus food from supermarkets. 
saving food from waste and going to landfill because normally um you know the best before dates or perhaps if the dam the package was damaged it would just get thrown straight into a skip and to landfill um so we collect from various supermarkets and um throughout the week as well so sometimes there's enough food to to create 50 food chair bags and on the right so on the left there, you can see a collection from Marks and Spencers, uh, sometimes about 20 boxes in one night. I don't know how we managed to fit it in the car, to be honest. Um, and then on the right is some of our, um, in the centre, the food chair room, uh, where we pack all the bags then and store it away as well to be able to give out to people um, the next day. So... Um, in addition to this as well, I started thinking about how we can think, you know, into the future sustainability, because it's great having a food bank. But when once that service stops, how do people continue to support themselves? So I started thinking about a community cookbook and inviting people to bring their own cultural recipes, perhaps from material um, ingredients that they've used in the food chair and how that can bring people together as a community as well, because we have people from all um, backgrounds and cultures come and use the drop-in centre. Although it's a lot of people from the area, we also get a lot of people across Swansea um, and further afield come to the drop-in centre as well. So this is just a picture of a lot of the food um, that we'd previously collected and that goes into some food chair bags then. Another important project in space at the centre is our community garden. This is where people come to volunteer, learn about the environment through, um, we get organisations in that help us learn how to teach people to grow their own food and veg. So the planters here were all from a session that we had done and we'd started um, growing our own veg. And this went out in our food chair, people took this at home as well. Um, and it was all about giving people the tools to be able to help support themselves as well. In the background there, um, the shelter. This is actually a green roof shelter. So this was planted to support biodiversity in the area. Um, and the wood that's used is Welsh, specialist Welsh timber wood as well. So everything was locally um, sourced. And then the little painting in the shelter, that's all from Eco Paint as well. So we tried to, we try to work um, as sustainably and efficiently as we can at the drop-in centre because that sort of goes with our aims. So this is just some pictures of, you know, some of the food that we're growing at the Dropping Centre. Over the past few years, I have tried to create links between my creative side, volunteering and the community. For me, being an artist is more than just creating. It's a need to respond. In 2011, I led two, pro um, not 2011, sorry, in 2021, I led two projects. The first was Explore Pandari, which was a project funded by Natural Resource Wales, and this had aims to connect people to their local green spaces. This was a one year project where I created a programme that was led by people in the area, what they wanted to learn and what they wanted to explore. During this time, we went on local nature walks and learned about the history of Pantlegare Woods, which is right on our doorstep. We also went to Community Farm and we interacted um, with their space there and you know we fed the animals we learned about nature we did activities as well um, and these are just some examples of what we did we did loads of things within the area We're, and it also shows people as well what's on their doorstep and how lucky we are to have all these green spaces um, in Blind and Mice. Um, every session as well would also be very accessible so if, if there was a disability or if someone was you know, nervous to come out, we'd be able to work with the community to try and get them involved um, because I feel that you need to make things accessible because otherwise you're never going to be able to support people. And I think that's really important in the work that we do as well. The second project I worked on was um, a project called Let's Bimble About. And that was funded by Swansea Council. So I worked with um, other artists, uh, one which is in um, the Zoom meeting, Belinda, so thank you for coming along. Um, and this was a project to create, where we created an art and nature programme to get young people involved in their local environment. And I thought this was really important. Um, you know, going on local walks, collecting items around us, giving young people a platform to share their ideas. 
and division of the area. At the end of this project, we created a garden exhibition, as you can see on the right, um, and we hung up some of the work um, at the drop-in centre and we invited families, uh, local MPs to come along and to see the work that is created by the young people in the area, because you often find that young people from this area are sort of under, undermined and they're pushed away. And I think it's really important to get their voices and their vision at the front of the community. Um, and as you can see on the left, this is from one of our sessions where we created nature crowns. So we went out, we collected um, some bits from the environment and we came back and then through art, we had conversations about it and we got the young people involved. And also as well, I, I think I feel a responsibility to give back, to provide opportunities to people, because I feel that if, if I don't provide these opportunities, who's going to provide them, you know, um, with services being cut and with, you know, a lack of funding, which is, you know, all around um, Wales, you know, these days, I think it's really important that you've, you've just got to respond. And, and I feel the need to respond because I live here. This was um, also from uh, the Bimble About project. So you can see um, some of the work that they created, prints, um, paintings as well. So um, what are my intentions as an artist and how does it connect to what I do? And why did I pursue a creative career in the arts? There's a quote that says, there are two distinct languages. There is a verbal which separates people and there is the visual that is understood by everybody. We seem to live in a world at the moment that is full of politics and constant barriers. There's barriers everywhere we go and these barriers can make people feel isolated and disconnected. There's something I feel that you can achieve through visual communication that I don't think can be achieved in words. The opportunity to look at something that someone has created and to know that is a form of self-expression that we can all relate to. From a young age, I've always had an interest in the arts and I've been fat, fat, um, fat, um, fascinated with photography. My grandparents would show, me an, would show me albums after albums of old photographs of the area I've grown up in and I would often photograph the things around me. I felt like a way to story tell and to feel a sense of connection to where I live. The idea that I could capture something from my own perspective, perhaps something that nobody else had noticed. It's a way to show other people how I see the world. And as, as I often find it difficult to communicate in words, I want other people to look at the work that I've created and for it to get them thinking. I feel the more that we start to ask questions, the more mindful we become of what's happening around us. There's another quote that says, creativity is critical thinking. Without it, how are we going to open up and ask harder questions? Art opens all these kind of passages and possibilities to think beyond what we already know. Every time I work with young people, I feel that there is an individuality that, that can be achieved through artwork for them to draw how they see the world around them without limits, without boundaries and without judgment. There is no barrier in art. I feel that there is an opportunity to educate people through art and for them to connect to what's right in front of them. For example, um, this is something I tried to achieve in the Bimble About project. In 2017, I decided to study a fine art degree at Swansea College of Art. I was never going to go to university, but there were a few people who encouraged me and that, that I could go there and study. So I decided to sign up um, sort of last minute. During this time in my degree, I got to understand art in a more contextual way. Its relation to other subjects, history, politics, geography, people. Across my studies, I was interested in research, figuring out how I could create art in response to something else. I saw it as an opportunity to learn, grow and discover. My work has always been created as a response from something. So these two pictures uh, were sort of some of my studio spaces. Uh, on the right was my fellowship and on the left was my final year at university and I was really fascinated by um, printing off my own work, experimenting was really important to me and seeing where my work sat in the world and the relationship between my research and my work and, and how I felt that I could communicate as an artist. After my degree I was awarded a 15-month fellowship 
where I decided to make some per more personal work to the landscape. Lockdown then came and our surroundings were no longer um, just a place but a feeling. I began documenting my surroundings as a way to communicate what was going on at the time. This feeling of emptiness, isolation, disconnection between people that we were so used to because of the pandemic. I started to consider this idea of how we occupy space. How do we communicate through space? What do spaces offer and what do they mean to people? When I think about creating a work, it's always rooted from a personal place, a reflective place, a place that communicates how I feel. Space means different things to different people. Think about where we've grown up, places we've often visited, places that make us feel safe. I often think about space as time, either what is happening right now, look, um, looking at once was, or what the future of that of a space will hold. Will it drastically change? Will it still will it still be a field or a home to someone? For me, to capture the landscape is to capture the stories of of places and people. During this time of my fellowship, I started to use my drone going to local spaces, capturing the land from a perspective people wouldn't usually have the chance to see from. It was interesting looking straight down at the landscape from above, seeing traces of movement from people, footsteps, tire tracks, car parks, as you can see on the right. One place I did focus on was a local building site, which was near to my home. I became interested by how the landscape was going to change, and I wanted to document this from an unusual perspective. So I used my drone. I knew the place was going to change and I wanted to document something that people could look back on. On, um, on Facebook, we've actually got a community page and um, a lot of people share images of blind and mice, what it used to look like before. And I wanted to be part of this sort of this community archive that documented um, you know, the landscape before um, it, had, it had changed because growing up with my grandparents, they'd always take photographs and show me of things that, you know, before houses were being built or before they were being knocked down. And I thought there was something really interesting um, within this as well. And um, I also come back to that. If I, if I wasn't an artist, perhaps I would have gone to study geography. And that's something that I'm really interested in within my work is linking the landscape you know, to geography because it is essentially, they're interlinked, how the landscape is changing, whether that's through climate change, whether that's through um, people using spaces or building on spaces. And um, that was really important in my work as well. Um, I began to play around with how I could use my images to create installations and to create something that I felt, that felt more physical, something of form and structure. So from my drone images, I began to play around with um, projections and using sculptures to be able to um, sort of capture the essence of the landscape, to capture how physical it actually is, not just a flat surface. So I began to create these little rocks with paper and my, my photographic images as well. During this time, I had an opportunity to show work in Elysium, Swansea. I used the images and created large scale sculptures that would be placed in the gallery. My intentions for this was to explore how we represent, how we represent people, how we represent the community and how we represent the land. I thought that by going large, I could catch people's attention and use it as an opportunity to talk about my area, the history of it and what it's like now what's changing and the impact this will leave on people. It was interesting that people would come up to me in Elysium and they would ask me what the pictures were, how I captured them, um, what area they were from. And it gave me an opportunity to be able to talk about blind and mice and to be able to put it on the map. And I feel that that was really important to be able to, to give my outlook as somebody who lives in an area um, that often has a false narrative that, are, that often people disregard and um, negatively have an Im uh, ne negatively have a comment um, associated with. I just wanted to finish by sharing some drawings of my local area. 
I recently had an opportunity to show these um, in um, in mid in mid Wales in Mo in Mulmama Conflith, and um, this last drawing is titled "This Place Is Home," and I suppose that's that's what I'm trying to capture. And as an artist, I constantly return to the initial question that Abby um, asked, and and that is questioning what does the landscape mean to me, and and as an artist and as somebody who works in the community. I feel that the work that I do in the community and my creative side comes together and I constantly um, I continue and I think about how I can continually respond um, to bring awareness and to drive for a better future because th through through visual communication and through working with other people I feel that it offers an, a new perspective and something that perhaps people haven't thought about before. And uh, that's the end of my talk. And I, I'd also just like to say as well, thank you very much to Abby um, and to the gallery as well for giving us the opportunity to talk about um, the landscape and, and how that connects to us as individuals and as young people. Because um, I know I've said it previously, but young people can often be disregarded that perhaps they don't know what they're talking about or you know, that, that, that their voice doesn't matter, but I feel it's really important and that young people talk about how they feel. And um, so I'd just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Alicia. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing your work and bringing that up too, because I, I felt incredible nerves before tonight and I've never felt so nervous for a zoom talk and i guess it was just being in that position where we control it and um speak about what we want to say um which is really liberating um i saw images of those sculptures alicia um but sadly couldn't make it down to see them and i, I just love that they look like mountains i think i saw a shot and there was like three yeah three um and I, I, I just, yeah, I thought they were I think, great. Yeah, I think that was um, sort of what I was, what I was after, sort of taking a piece from the landscape and putting it somewhere else. And I, I titled that work as well. Is there anything left? Coming back to that, that constant question of how the landscape is changing, um, and, and I thought, how could I use my imagery as well to create something that's physical, and you know, like a shape of landscape, and and how bringing the landscape inside as well. Um, can create conversations. So it was, it was really interesting. And I look forward to seeing where the work goes as well. That's great. And, um, and yeah, and the, the importance of archiving and documenting, because I, I think I've realized that within my research, the archive has become a really important thing and libraries and museums, resources, and um, one website that's, always really useful to me is the people's collection um, online so it's like a public collection that anyone can upload content into so some are more historic some are more contemporary and there's different themes and tags and I know when I moved up here to Chorus it was like new place I've got I've got to see archival imagery of this place I've got got to get a sense and I'd never thought that I could begin contributing to that but until tonight, <laughs> that our, our images and our work are archival documents from now and today. Um, so that's an amazing realization as well. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're drawing to an end. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I know there's also some feedback, evaluation responses as well to fill in. Um, you're welcome to ask a question to me, Alicia, or Yastin, you can unmute or ask in the chat. Yeah, we're, we're all yours. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you from the gallery. Just such interesting talks from all of you. And I think what really struck me is that they were so personal like so rooted in your own lived experience. Um, yeah, really amazing. I had a question for Yestin 
um, I kind of feel like I, I can, I, I might know what the answer is, but when you were talking about the North Wales landscape and sheep farming, I just, what came into my head is, is an article that George Monbiot wrote quite a long time ago now um, about uh, the sort of sheep bitten deserts of deserts of North Wales that, that he is very against sheep farming, he would like to see upland Wales reforested. And it was a very, very controversial um, article for lots of Welsh people and especially Welsh hill farmers. Um, and, but, I, but it's interesting because what you talked about was quite nuanced that actually their lives are really hard. There's really high deprivation actually amongst the farming community. Um, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that and the way that he did it, but also what he said. I, I'm assuming that most people know who George Monbiot is and, and obviously he's a, he's a climate activist. I think a problem very often with, with or whenever there's talk of rewilding or whatever, um, it's often very, it's, it's, it's communicated in a very sort of violent way, I think, and 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 it it feels like people coming in from somewhere else with big ideas and deciding they're going to turn huge tracts of of countryside uh, back back to forestry. Um, I think also with regards to yeah, lots of the the criticism there's been of yeah, as you say, the sort of uh, hills made barren and desolate by by sheep farming and stuff. Um, Often that's a result of things that farmers have been subsidised by the government to do at other times in history when they've been told this is what you should do now. So, you know, you should you should dry out the, the peat box or whatever, for example, and then 30 years down the line, they're told, oh, actually, you should you should restore them or whatever. Um, so that's often there. But I think it's all it's all about about communication, isn't it? And, and being with feet on the ground and, and knowing what the actual situation is. And then I know actually in, in sort of the Machenthith area now, um, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk about rewilding. Um, and uh, I think it, it, they went into it at the beginning. It was it was it was very bullish, wasn't it? And the, the way and then obviously there was a, there was a massive uproar in, in response. Um, but now you've got a project like um, I think it's called the Orman Irmar, which are they're, they're going about it in a in a far more um, cooperative way, looking at ways that that everyone can sort of work together to to protect the landscapes and and make them more more sustainable the way they manage uh, to the future. Um, so it's always got to be a conversation, hasn't it? I think that mm -hmm. maybe the the weakness in the way these things have been done in the past is is people coming in and and saying this is what you have to do now, um, and that never works with anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. There's a lovely comments in the chat from Hinos about um, common themes. I'll just read it out. Um, so opposites and paradoxes, land, water, solid, liquid, battle with the land, Sarmio, farming, battle to protect the land, Truirin, rich in resource, poverty and deprivation, romanticized ideals, harsh realities. So Dioch Hinos. Zoe, would you like to ask something? I would actually. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, everybody. It's been really enjoyable. Um, thanks for hosting as well, Emily. Um, I just wanted to say, Alicia, that I work at the Waterfront Museum in the Graft Garden. And uh, seeing as you're so local and doing fairly similar kinds of things up in Blind and Mice, it would be really nice to connect with you, maybe join up some of our groups and things and partner work a bit more. Yeah, that would, that would be really great. We um we try to make as many connections as we can outside of the community and work with organisations. Um, so I'd be really keen to to definitely connect up and see how we can work together. Ah, I'll um I'll drop you a line with my details. Thanks. That's great. Thank you.
There's another lovely comment in the in the chat, um, Abby. I don't know if you've seen that from Phil Lambert. Do I read it out? Yeah. It's so heartening to see landscape re-emerge as a complex, contemporary, and socially interconnected topic, as opposed to purely the picturesque. I agree. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I often found being called a landscape photographer or a landscape artist as well is is quite challenging because you you don't want to remain in a in a position where you're creating this idyllic thing of beauty. And I, I think I realized that quite young as I was in my teenage years. Um, I was photographing the landscape in quite a naive and innocent way and painting that and drawing that. And, you know, it had to be sunny blue skies and everything perfect and the, the little sheep running across the hill. And, um, and I guess that's just where my mind and awareness was at the time. And then I think, yeah, it wasn't until after leaving school and perhaps growing practice and then going to places and understanding their history, understanding that, you know, the forests that you're walking in aren't actually natural forests, they're sort of man-built constructions and the, the land is being deprived, nothing can grow there. And you're sort of realizing that this nature around you isn't quite what it seems. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it, it was quite challenging to, to change that into practice. And I think as well to bring in reasons. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's interesting. I really felt from all your talks, th this idea of nuance, you know, this idea of, uh, there seems to be like simplicity, like simplification is such a kind of modern phenomenon, isn't it? Just to sort of simplify everything, everything's, very black and white and it's you know it's interesting how the war in Ukraine I don't want to use the word captured imaginations that feels like the wrong thing to the wrong phrase to use but but it's I don't know people have got very drawn into it I think because it's presented as a very very simplistic kind of good against evil um fight uh, un unlike the war the recent wars in in Syria and the continuing war in Yemen which is is more complicated I think people are drawn to simplicity and or, or at least the media draws people in the direction of simplicity um but it's really lovely to hear these sort of really complex nuance of multi-layered um you know talks and, and uh, about landscape i've really really enjoyed that it, it's yeah it's been really great thank you um there's a nice comment from pip and should, do you want to read that out abby and then maybe we'll wrap up unless anyone else has got any question I'll, I'll read it out. <laughs> Thank you, Abby, Yastin and Alicia for your presentations. So good to hear your voices and to see, hear about your work and hugely important at this time when the landscape is under threat slash change. Be mm. awesome. Yeah, thanks, Pip. So that was really so great. Thank you so, so much, Abby, for curating such a wonderful evening. Um, and I just wanted to say that next week, same time next week, we have a talk curated by Kerry Ann Wilshire Davis. Um, and that's going to be amazing. And um, we haven't quite got the Eventbrite link <laughs> yet, um, but we will soon. So if you follow Oriel Martin Gallery on any of our social medias, that, um, that link will, will be out very soon and you can book for that talk. Um, we also have a photography exhibition opening uh, on Saturday um, of Hugh Alden Davis's work. Um, and that will be on at the gallery um, until May. And we have our fantastic Craig and Becker 
project with um, artist Catherine Campbell Dodd. Abby mentioned the Rebecca riots. Um, so this is uh, Catherine Campbell Dodd's celebration of the Rebecca riots, and in particular, this very potent object, the Kragenbecker, which is a conch shell blown to gather the uh, daughters of Rebecca together for the Rebecca riots. Um, this is an object in Carmarthenshire Museum and the project is, is in collaboration with Carmarthenshire Museums. And there will be a big parade, slightly a reenactment of the Rebecca, the 1843 Rebecca riots on the 1st of May in Carmarthen. So I'd love it if as many people as possible could come to that because it's going to be great. We're also working with Oshan Mehler, who Yastin mentioned in his talk. Um, so yeah, that's going to be an amazing event. So that's what's happening at Oriel Marthin in the next couple of months. Um, but yes, thank you again to Abby, Alicia, uh, Yestin and Evie Banks from Amgiedwa Cymru. Big thanks for your help and support in the lead up to this talk. Um, and to Delith for translation Diochan Vaur Iawn um, And thank you all for coming. Um, Diochan Vaur and see you soon. Dioch. Oil. Great. Well I'm, done, guys. You did amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. Good. I'm remembering to copy and paste the chat. <laughs> Oh yes. <laughs> Have you remembered? I remembered. Nice. Did you have many people messaging you privately? Yeah, quite a few. I mean, not loads, but yeah. probably ten. I reckon responses. That's, that's pretty good. To be fair. Yeah, and hopefully some clicked through to the online one. So exactly. I checked with Zoe as well, and she said all you can do is ask. So yeah, you, know, yeah. you can't force someone's yeah. hand, can you? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>